head off the trunks. I'm the Cryptid Munchers, Jessica Jones, and I'm ready to take you on a mysterious journey right now. We welcome you guys to Off the Trails right here on the Space Out Radio's YouTube channel. Shout out to Bumblefoot for that amazing intro music. I so appreciate that. And also, you guys, please follow us on Twitter at Space Out Radio, on Instagram at Space Out Radio Show, and on TikTok at Space Out Radio. You guys can find me at thecryptidhuntress.com, and I have an awesome, awesome YouTube channel. That's the Cryptid Huntress over there on YouTube. And uh, also, if you guys would like to support what I do, all my shows, uh, I have a really awesome Patreon. And, uh, and I have, it really coincides with my remote viewing show that I do on Thursday nights. Uh, you guys, please go become a member there. I'd love to have you as part of my Patreon family. Uh, also, I have a shop that's called War Woman Goods. And uh, I want to give a big shout out to all my Patreon members and to everybody who has been supporting me with my shop. Y'all are the best. Okay. Um, I have a fantastic guest here in the studio tonight. I have Tony Rodriguez in the studio tonight. Uh, you guys, I'm sure you heard of him. And also, I have an extra guest tonight. We're going to have, I've got two guests actually. I had a last minute friend uh, hop on with us uh, to hang out with Tony. We all hung out, out together recently at the Journey to Truth conference over in Grafton, Illinois. I have Barry Littleton here tonight uh, to hang out. So, um, don't forget that right after this show, Marquise has a great program set up for us tonight over at After Hours. So um, let's get to our guest tonight. Tony Rodriguez is a 20-year secret space program tour experiencer, author of the autobiography series Colony Cavalier and its sequel Project Star Maker. He hosts weekly meetups through Talks with Tony, a Patreon group focused on disclosure, consciousness expansion, and remote viewing. He has created a memory recall course for others who suspect they may have been involved in similar programs. And I had the pleasure of hanging out with Tony, like I said, not too long ago. It's been about a month now, I guess. And, uh, and we talked remote viewing, y'all. We may even talk about remote viewing a little bit tonight. Uh, I also have my friend, our friend, Barry Littleton, very good friend of the show. Uh, he's here with us. He's an amazing researcher, an experiencer, and uh, yeah, just an all around smart dude. Okay, and he's my good friend. So please help me welcome to the show tonight. I've got Tony and Barry here in the studio. Hey, Tony. Hi, everybody. Hi, Jessica. Hey. Let's see. I'm trying to get Barry up. That computer's slow. There he is. Everything's going slow these days. <laughs> it is. There he is. Let's hope he doesn't disappear. Greetings. What's up, hey, Tony? Hey. What's up, Jessica? Hey. How y'all doing? It's always a pleasure. <laughs> it's great to see you guys again. It's been a, hey, been a little bit. Me yeah, too. Yeah. That, was, that was a great conference. It really was good. You know, I liked mm -hmm. that 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 just the attitude of the people, but everybody was so you know engaging, and it was nobody being secular or anything like that. I thought it was cool. That's right. And Tony, you had an amazing presentation that you gave us. I mean, when I hear the word or the phrase "secret space program," I think of Tony. Okay, I think of you. Uh, you're one of the more popular names uh, that people are familiar with when it comes to that program. Actually, in my in my opinion. Because uh, yep. I, yeah, um, tell tell the audience a little bit. See, I I, I focus mostly on cryptids uh, with my show. Can you tell the audience, give them a little background on what the secret space program is and kind of how you got involved in that? Yeah, well, um, that's a whole story in its own. But oh, it's, yes. uh, secret <laughs> space program is the fact that humans have been going to space for a very long time, and governments have been doing it since World War II, and they've contacted nearby ETs and work with them hand in hand and trade resources and, and technology. And the United States is up there and certain corporate groups are up there. And uh, it's a whole different animal than what we believe. Uh, it's a whole different uh, mindset of human rights and lifestyle from what we believe we live in today down here. And uh, I was taken into the programs. I was 10 years old and I... Um, rubbed elbows with somebody that had access to the program and didn't get along with their kid. So they threw me in as a kind of a punishment. And I lived for 20 years as slave labor. I did some horrible things and then was traded from black program to black program. And by that, I mean secret uh, to um, on the earth for about six years, six or seven years, and then sold off into the secret space program, which is in, uh, which was off world. 
And so I went to the moon and then to Mars and then was sold off to a planetoid, a colony that's inside a planet, a dwarf planet called Ceres, C-E-R-E-S. And uh, that's in between Mars and the asteroid belt. And I lived there for better part, uh, you know, more than a decade. And I worked on interstellar trade missions. I worked, I basically worked on UFOs. I was a crew member on what we see as UFOs. We flew back to the earth all the time. We were very often, we came back to earth. We took cargo, we took people back and forth and and other star systems and in fact to other galaxies so space is very accessible when you talk about it's funny you know in the intro we talked about a bunch of things already uh, remote viewing the secret yeah. space program cryptids and the funny thing is is that they have they all have their own community the communities gather around what people see so when somebody sees a ufo in their yard they're shocked and they grab they percolate and and go end up in the ufo community certain you know the secret space program community they, they because they're trying to justify they saw it with their own eyes when somebody sees bigfoot they're ending up in the cryptid community and when somebody has yeah. a visions of the future constantly then they end up in the psychic community but the reality is they're all just the same exact community they're hidden it's yeah. hidden information it's hidden information by the elites from the mainstream from mainstream education and from mainstream media they hide all these things because they're real powerful. They're, the knowledge is very powerful. So it's all hidden. But we're all basically, the, you you know, I, I like the idea of calling it the truth or community, throwing a blanket on it. Because really, psychic oh, yeah. phenomena, ET phenomenon, they're all the same thing. And the cryptid phenomenon, I believe. Most of the cryptids are okay. ETs visiting. I don't know. What's your take? You tell me. You're the expert. Yeah. No, I... I don't know what anything is anymore, Tony. I really don't. <laughs> right. So <laughs> that's right. The beautiful and then, part. Yeah. That's the other thing. Well, yeah, I got to say the elites are, yeah. that's another plan of theirs too. Is most people are like, well, it comes up all the time. Is the earth even round? You know, oh my like, gosh. Are, we on? Is it, are we in a simulation? Everybody's every, the simulation is the, the new one that you're in a video. You're just a character in a video game. And I'm like, well, yeah. you know, this character in a video game is pretty sore when I get out of bed in the morning. So <laughs> yeah, right. it's one hell of a great simulation. Yeah, that simulation's badass because my back is still sore from yesterday. So, oh my gosh, yeah. I mean, that's 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 kind of like with like with cryptids. It's when we're out there doing all this research out in the field. Uh, it's almost like the well, you think you have things figured out, right? And you're like, oh, I know what Bigfoot is, and it's interdimensional, and it's this and that, and and then you go back in the field, and then you you have another experience, and then you realize that everything you thought you knew goes out the window, okay, because something else happens. A portal opens up, and now you see a Bigfoot walk through a portal, and they disappear or something, you know. Uh, and so it just, it it's really confusing, but it keeps us out there in the field doing more research, you know, just to, to try to figure it out. So it's yeah, interesting. Everybody's just after the truth. Yeah. And even people, right. I've met people at different conferences that outward told me, because of the drama, you know, we've had a, the, the secret space program, information had a community that really thrived people really understood it really rang true and it grew, grew masses of people and then the rug was just jerked out of it uh, from, un from underneath of them and a lot of people are disgusted by the behavior of some of the people that have disclosed information and so a lot of people just turn and we go ah whatever you guys are all fighting with each other whatever and then we've also had a lot of false testimonies come forward um that are that are everywhere all at once you know, you got guys that come up yesterday and then all of a sudden they have everything. And then they do it. They do an interview on a YouTube channel. It's got 1000 subscribers and every other video has got 50 or 60 views. And then they've got one with 20,000 views in the first hour. It just doesn't make okay. sense. And these guys are popping all up right. all over the place and it's dissipating the real information because it's important information. We're talking about people that are being abducted, being subjected to things against their will. And being put back with advanced technology and the, the the main modality that they get away with it is secrecy so if we're telling the yeah. truth about it we're very dangerous and it's the same like i said and it, it crosses right over the whole cryptid thing like yeah. uh you know bigfoot sightings are more like a uh, et sighting than a animal than a rare animal sighting you know i've been in the been in the wilderness and seen rare animals i've seen you know white white deer and like there's a rare bird in Hawaii that I saw, and it's like an amazing, it's a magical experience. It's nothing like a Bigfoot experience. It's not even close. It's nothing, yeah. it's not even the same realm. And so you're looking at it, it's the, the, my experience, from what I remember, my memories are a long time ago from when I was in space and when I was working on a UFO. 
But I'll tell you, when you hang out with an extraterrestrial being, especially an advanced one, um, it's a different uh, vibe. It's a different exp- interaction, and it's a di- just standing, not even talking to them, but just standing in proximity and feeling the energy from something that's very smart. That is what you what appears to you as not a human, a non-human, is a feeling in in and of itself, and that's what that's what most cryptid. Uh, witness accounts sound like they sound more like an ET visitation than than a, a rare animal. The the yeah. white buffalo. And, and some of us actually in the field that do Bigfoot field research, we get visited by ETs. Okay, that's we right. Experiences with them, yeah. Yeah, and then they follow up. Going, what are you guys doing poking around? You know, that's, that's right. really what they're doing is going. What they're mm-hmm. checking you out. Why are you poking around? Yeah. I would I would venture to say this and. You know, I apologize ahead of time, but I'd venture to say that if that's the case, that there's things that you don't remember. Oh, yeah. So, Absolutely. you know, that comes hand in hand. If you're visiting, if you're having an ET visit you in your home um, and then you don't exactly remember why, uh, I would venture to say that there's a lot more going on. Uh, typically, oh, yeah. there's a lot more going on. Absolutely. What do you say about that, Barry? Bar- Barry's our ET guy. <clears throat> well, I agree. You know, it's something that Tony and I have talked a lot about is the different kind of contact that we've had, you know, and he's correct. You know, when you're actually in the presence of a non-human, what is it like? First of all, it's mind blowing just to your senses themselves. And then they're telepathically telethought blowing you up at the same time, answering questions before you can ask them. And the ones I've been around, a lot of them, the bio, their bio field, their aura, something about it that seems to cause like a Shakti Pat in us. It felt like a lot of times like I was having a kundalini release around these beings and the type of elation comes with it and things like that. And you don't always hear about that, you know, and that leads when you start thinking about in the past, people that interacted with these beings, why they were calling them gods and having these misconceptions, you know, but uh, Mm -hmm. it it, it is it is really a trip. It's really a trip. And I and I I I get a little upset with the amount of confinement that the community has concerning the beings that we're actually interacting with, you know, that they must much, much more wide. You know, something we did that, that interview on your show, Tony, I got so many responses about specifically, we kept talking about different insectoid races and you mentioned some ones on Mars and the moon. And that uh, I got so many responses from that. And you know about that, Jessica. A lot of insectoids yeah. are out there, and it's, it's fascinating. I've seen one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and at what point, when we start evolving, as far as speed vibrationally, sometimes that insectoid thing comes in. That buzzing. It's a very interesting where things can go as far as evolution. Mm-hmm. So. Well, and like you said, the the everybody treats it like a small neighborhood. You know, like you know, I, I was last night. I was contacted by the Pleiadians. I you hear that all the time. Like, right. And people say, "Well, I I had an ET yeah. visit. You know, I had an ET experience." And the people chime right in. Well, the VTs that visit me are Pleiadian, so excuse me. I'm way right. better than you. My ETs are better than your ETs. Oh my god. The reality is, yeah. the reality is, is that we are. They're not from there. They're from somewhere that we don't. From stars, most of them that they visit us are from stars that we don't have names for. So wow. we only see about 3,000 stars in the night sky that we have popular names for. The rest are numbers. And they're visiting us from trillions of different star systems. It's easy. Wow. It's a day at the office. They can get up at 8 in the morning. They can be here at 9 in the morning and be back home at 3 in the afternoon. You know, that's how fast space travel is taking place on another galaxy to another galaxy. So we, we everybody has the name and the location of this nearby star for their ET that visited them. And that's not possible. So there's so many visitations, like and like you said, Barry. There's more than one. There, the human biology is popular in the cosmos. The reptilian pop, biology, reptilian, is more popular, and the insectoid is, you know, the animal versions of humanoids are very popular, more popular than humans. So, but there are a lot of us. Up. We could, you could be standing next to somebody in public that is from a star system that we have no name for that has never been here before that they are representing somebody for the it could be a first contact they could be somebody that came down just for the for the moment they've never been in this neck of the woods before this is the vastness of the reality of space is that it's very vast that trillions of worlds and species 
yeah. can interact with each other on a daily basis. So the, wow. the, the number is unimaginable. We don't imagine the different amount of species. Wow. We're thinking of it in terms like, no, oh, they're Andromedans, they're Lyran. Yeah. Your last yes. life, you were a Pleiadian. You were, I can't even think of a Syrian. Like these, all these nearby things. It's like, that's all the same group of people. That's the nearby stars are all the same price. When yeah. you, you know what I'm saying? Like the t shirt costs the same amount at all of the, on all of those stars that are nearby us. You have to go very far away to find cheaper t shirts. It's just like <laughs> in the world. Like, you know, when you go to Thailand, yeah, everything in America is the same price and the same culture, basically, even the vast different cultures, you know, all across. When you go to Thailand or somewhere very distant, some other culture, you can find different go goods for prices and the spaces like that. You have to go very, very far away before you start to get leave our local culture of ETs. It doesn't matter what the species are. They all work together. So when people blanket it, like you said, Barry, man, and I, you know, high five you on that. When people throw a blanket over, you know, all the ETs are from right over the, from that star there. That's those are my ETs. It's unlikely, it's highly unlikely. You, you know, something I, I think that really is worth iterating on is something you brought up, Tony, is that the amount of contact people are having that it seems like it might just be a second, whether it's you see an, 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 an extraterrestrial in your in your in your room when you wake up or you're dreaming about one, opposed to even just seeing one. The amount of people, especially that were seeing these things before the drone era, you know, they were seeing these these things and just even for a few seconds and nobody else in the crowd can see it. But two people out of 20, you know, the amount of contact that happens on the super conscious level and vibrationally is incredible. You know, and I think that that's not what's getting enough attention right now. It's not all negative, not all positive, but that's where a lot of communication goes down in our super conscious subconscious levels you know almost theta nearly delta some of it that's right uh, so we are are we're probably man and i'm gonna i'm just thinking out loud because i'm hanging out with you guys and like there are people watching this <laughs> is what it's like when we're, when we're all just hanging out together this is the kind of stuff we talk about yeah. but, <laughs> but i'm gonna think out loud and say that most people we really as where we're at in a hundred year human existence we're a hundred year old that's it so we're we're uh, we're a certain we're at a level of human existence. We're probably pretty stupid. I mean, <laughs> put it, to put it to put it unfriendly, we're probably yeah. pretty inadequate for our for what other beings. You know, our bodies are probably really nerfed. Really, oh, yeah. we've we've really been turned down. So a lot happens in our subconscious that we would otherwise realize, but we just don't have act. We don't have the mind for it. Like when you talk about time travel, people can't just fit, can't. People they go, what? We can't really have a simple, easy conversation about time travel. We don't have the brains for it. It's that simple. We just don't have the brain for it. And it's it's a convert it's a it's a subject that's out of our realm. And so we, we you know, we're mankind in our lifetime has has evolved already. When you talk wow. to you know, Barry, you do QHHT. I mean, you know, Suzanne said that early on with Dolores Cannon, people nobody remembered their Nobody was conscious. They had no memory of it. They got put under and they didn't remember it. And now everybody remembers it. Everybody's semi-conscious while they're at it. They can remember it. because so something happened. So mankind changed because it's the same process. It's the same thing that they're all going through. But now everybody is awake and goes, oh, yeah, I remember saying that. So mankind, we've changed. We've grown in just that short time. We've evolved. There's been an evolution. There's That's a document. You know what I mean? That's a benchmark. And so we are getting there. We're in, and the kids nowadays, I mean, let's face it, they're super advanced. My kids are walking around with crystals and do it, charging them. And yeah. like they're doing stuff. The kids are, the kids have a different, uh, the kids have evolved, you know, whether, and they're being steered, I think, in, in self destructive ways, the same way we were. But we were, we are evolving. Mankind is evolving. So, like you said, theta interactions may be coming from other minds that are, on, that are evolved to that level and they just, they're talking to us and we can't hear it. You know, we just don't have the ear for it. So mm -hmm. I think that's a lot of, there's a lot of interaction like that. Yeah. A lot, a lot. Yeah. Tony, we have, a, we have a question. Do you think the aliens are demons? That's a question I get asked all the time. What do you think about that? I, I think demons are like mosquitoes, energetic mosquitoes. <laughs> I think energetically a demon isn't much. I think that we are demons to our animals to your you know if you had bacon this morning that pig didn't appreciate it yeah. right so you're a very okay. bad person to that we're we're we are we are raising them 
animals for our food supply and the plants too unless that life consumes life period you're not on a moral high ground to be a vegetarian the plants don't enjoy being the grass doesn't enjoy being cut so when you look at perspective we are bad at that point so demons are just another entity that's feeding off of us energetically in one way and there probably is a, a one that you know like a like a um a luciferian very bad thing that just sees us all as fodder it sees right. humans as like a you know like an animal so but as far as the grays and the other human the other humanoids and they're not demons they're people just like us yeah all the ets we were classified when series colony corp it's about it went by the i say this all the time it went by the amount of words that you naturally spoke and if it spoke 150,000 words or to 250 it was a person and when it sold half a million to a million it was a uber per, uber person and then a meta person and then ultra person so they were you know it went into data when you're telepathic it's, there's not words it's amount of data and so there are some forms of telepath tele forms of telepathy blah, blah, blah. i need some bubble gum or something <laughs> that are just words that are just the amount of data like what i'm saying right now is say to you guys right now this room is pretty warm it's warm in here that's a small amount of data that's a kilobyte of data to yeah. let if i say it telepathically that's the same amount of data that I said. But if I telepathically show you the room and let you feel and smell the temperature and you can smell it and everything, there's a bigger amount of data that gets transferred in the same instant. And so there are different levels of telepathy and different levels of classifications of people. And so they're people. They're not demons. So we really, okay. the, the construct of good and evil has been shoved down our throat from, day, from the cradle to the grave on yes, everybody at times ever. Everything is, there's every shit story has a good guy and a bad guy. The good guy is always good and the bad guy is always bad. That's not true. It's not how it is for me and you. Jessica, I love you. Right. I might catch you on a bad day and go, oh, I'm getting out of here. She's on a warpath. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. and you might do the same with me. Like I get grumpy if I go without sleep and I'm not a bad guy, but I'm not a good guy either. You know right. what I'm saying? I'm a man. I'm a person. And I, I'm a Christian Tony. I totally agree with that. I think that's a great answer. I feel the same way about it. But people do ask me all the time about the alien versus demon thing. So uh, it's interesting. Now, speaking, okay, now this is a not so exciting subject here. It's kind of sad. Uh, we talk about missing people a lot on my shows um, because uh, a lot of people go missing out of their national parks. Okay. And, uh, and that's where we do a lot of our Bigfoot research, our dogman research. And, uh, and I wanted to know your opinion or if you know, uh, could some of these people that go missing, uh, I don't think the Sasquatch is taking all of them, okay? Uh, I think that some of them are being kidnapped and potentially being put into programs like the Secret Space Program. Uh, what do you say about that? Um, so the, most, of the, most of the intake from the programs that I'm aware of, when they want talented people, they're being groomed at a young age. So they're looking at genetics. So if your dad was in the program, they're going to follow the kids and see which ones are most ideal. And they can groom them genetically, even prenatal genetic treatments go on. We hear about it a lot. So most of the program intake on that, on people that are going to be contributing to the program, most of the slave labor comes out of the prisons. So they get people out of the prisons. So I believe that they might be either a, um, an underground thing, like one of the undergrounds. They're, they're, let's face it, there may be underground species that are indigenous that have been here from the whole time that we just have never interacted with. And they come up, you know, and when they see people, they have a method of seeing from far away and come up and grab people. It may be the government trying to experiment on people. And it's a perfect example. It's a perfect place. You know, they may have designated areas to say, look, from time to time, we need to grab people for these experiments or for this program and they designate and say anybody that wanders in here go ahead and that makes sense because that's they shouldn't be there anyway uh, you know i don't yeah. think that's the case but i'm saying that there's common ground this earth seems to be from from working with people that are, have done um you know the contacted me to try to sort out their own memories i've worked with so many people what i found is that the earth seems to be cut up into regions where different programs take people from so in other words, people from the United States and Canada and Europe team tend to go into one program and people in Australia and South uh, Africa and South America tend to end up in different programs. They tend to describe different experiences when they, after they're abducted. So the, the permanent abduction, which is somebody that goes and never comes back, may be designated to a 
uh, national park area to those areas. And oh my gosh. It seems like the ETs have cut up the earth and said, you guys can take from these people and you guys can take from these. And so that may be part of it. The, there may be a legality to it. So I'm only yeah. speculating. I'm thinking out loud. <clears throat> well, well I, I, I often wonder about the national parks, like um, in our government back in the day, um, I think it was Roosevelt that designated all this land for national parks. Did he do, did he designate that land because he knew there were Sasquatch there? I mean, a lot of times there's underground facilities underneath these national parks. And I come across those when I'm remote viewing. And you mm -hmm. know a little something about remote viewing, Tony, right? I do a little, I've dabbled a okay. bit and I have a remote view group that we, uh, we do. It's fledgling. I'm just getting it started underway, and we're doing. We're we're working on many different techniques of remote viewing. So it turns out there's more than one way to do it. And the idea of the class that I teach is to learn each method, and so that take what works the best for you. And what's crazy is that literally every single week, you know, we meet weekly. Sometimes uh, this last week for the holiday, we took off. We meet weekly, but every single week I do the calculate the probability of what, it, you know, sometimes it's like one in 250,000, sometimes worse, but we always beat the probability every single time, every single time. There are some people that remote view and I, they get like a ricochet, like they don't get anything near the target, but they get a details of somewhere else besides right. the target. But the group as a whole, when I take everybody's results and average it out and come up with a score, we always beat the probability every single time. So remote viewing is, I, I was on, somebody in San Jose said that, um, the Farsight method was debunked. Farsight was debunked. There's a big thing, science, like a science paper written on it. And that's just total <laughs> nonsense because it takes, I can, I, we can do a remote view. I, I mean, we can, we can rebunk the Farsight in, uh, method in about 30 <laughs> minutes. And I'll bet I come hey, up, I beat the probability easily. Hey, to, 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 you remember Cocoa Beach? Um, we had, there was a remote viewer there and, you know, the, the one thing about the far side, I got to say, is, you know, they use the cat suits, man. I, I can't complain <laughs> about the cat suits. Anyway. <laughs> You're funny. They do have nice outfits, for sure. Absolutely. It's sexy, baby. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with remote viewing and, and cat suits. I don't know. It's okay. And however you need to get it done. And I'm not going to touch that. I'm not yeah. going to touch yes, that. Yes, I like so, it. For everybody okay. watching, you should, you should get some Faraday fabric. A Faraday fabric. <laughs> That's a good idea. That's a good idea. I'm trying to divert this combo. I'm trying yeah, to take actually, you know what? It wouldn't be a bad idea to have like a Faraday hat or something when you're remote viewing. Ah, I have a hat. I haven't really. Yeah. I haven't had any. I haven't had any luck with the hat. I bought the hat. Oh really? It, yeah. I don't really. Um, it doesn't. It hasn't done anything for me. But yeah. I do have fabric that I use, and just it helps me sleep because I have Wi-Fi and everything in my room, and the nights that I sleep with the Faraday blanket. I dream, mm -hmm. I sleep much better. I, I sleep yeah. much better. It's, it's noticeable. Like yeah. I literally can take it off and I wake up and go, wow, I didn't sleep for the damn last night. And I look and I kicked yeah. it off for me. So the days that I have the Faraday fabric, I've got Wi-Fi in my room. So a lot of people in my groups okay. on the Patreon, I have a tier three, a tier two and a remote viewing group. And a lot, I recommend it to a lot of people and they say, well, I got it. Nothing really happened. And we look at it. They don't have a lot of EMF uh, in their, where they're sleeping anyway. So you can get you can get download apps on your phone and see where your EMF is fields is in your room, yeah. and I've got like a really high end, you know like I said I've got Wi Fi there I got the fuse box I got a lot going on, and so when I get under the blanket like I get I have much clearer dreams all of it, and Ooh, so Faraday Faraday fabric is the way to go it's something worth having. That's awesome yeah you know when we were learning remote viewing. Uh, we actually would do it down at my farm and, uh, and we had, uh, no Wi-Fi, no television, no telephones, no nothing. We'd even leave our phones out in the car to keep them out. All of that radiation, all the wire, anything out of the area, uh, while we were actually in the house doing our training and stuff. So, yeah. And it was out in the middle of nowhere in the country. It's one of the major right. tricks. So the more I research yeah. about it, that that's, that's a major thing. Um, yeah, not having EMF. EMF radiation. So you know how I got into remote viewing? What led me there was researching my own testimony from what happened to me when I was in Peru. So that's what I, that was the first, that was one of the first things that, that was my first stop after I was taken wow. into the 20 and back as they retrained me. I, you know, I went through a um, MK Ultra style trauma-based mind control program that was into remote viewing that went into a, Industrial remote viewing, basically an offshoot of Project Grow Flame in the CIA. Okay. I found the paperwork about it. I found the funding, oh, right. all of that. And um, 
then we were shipped. I was shipped to Peru, and I was on a plane with plane shipments of cocaine in '83 and '84. Uh, and they would put us under out to near death experience, and then I would remote view if the cops were there, or the weather was bad, or if the plane was wow. like that's what they were doing. That's what they were using it for. Anyhow, when I researched all that and I had my memories of it, they, um, I went, oh, this is, and then I found the, the modern version of where we're at today and uh, looked into it and lo and behold, it works, you know, so that kind of led me down the, down the rabbit hole of researching remote viewing. And uh, it's actually super fun when you get a group of people, you know, we have envelopes and everybody tells what they saw, they do their view and then we open the envelope and, and go and people gasp because they get really, really, really close, a lot of them. Oh, yeah. No, I love remote viewing. That's my thing. Barry, actually, I've, I've taught Barry how to task me with targets, uh, coordinates. And so we, we Barry comes on my show a lot, and uh, we do a lot of remote viewing. Uh, okay, I have a question for you. This just came into my mind. How did you get your memories back, Tony? Uh, after you, you went and you spent, you were 10 years old when you left, when you got kidnapped, you spent 20 years away and then you came back and you were a child again. That's right. How did you get your memories back from that whole experience? So yeah, best I can tell it's April 17th, 1982 it was a Thursday. I was taken Thursday night and lived for 20 years in these programs and then put back and I woke up Friday morning back in my 10 year old body. Felt like I'd been gone for 20 years and I didn't have the memories. The memories were erased, but I had the sensation of being gone. Um, few weeks later, I remembered the abduction experience. I always remembered the first 30 minutes, the ET in my face, the gray and the reptilian. I always remembered them. And so I was searching my whole life, trying to figure out what the hell happened to me. And as it happened later on, like when I was 17, things that were happening when I was, when I was 17, where I was remembering fragments of them as they happened in real time. So there were two of me and uh, in my 20s. And I never made sense of it. I always thought, well, maybe they abducted me a few times because I don't remember being old. This memory, I remember being old on a spaceship with ETs. And this one, I remember being a young kid in Seattle. I remember I had mem all these memories, but they were all over the place. So I, so to answer your question, I had many of the memories, but they just didn't make any damn sense. I thought, when could that have happened? When was I living in Seattle? Like I had, I had memories of, of months and months of being bored and doing things in Seattle. And I couldn't put my finger on it when when that happened. I didn't. It wasn't a past life either because it was at the same time. Um, but in 2015, I got an MRI scan of my head, and about mm -hmm. ten seven days later, seven to ten days after that, coincidentally came across the Randy Kramer account where he said, "Look, they're taking people for 20 years and putting them back." And when I when I opened my eyes to that, I went, "That's what they did." I went. Oh God, it was one abduction. I thought maybe I had been abducted and I just didn't remember it many times. And I thought it took me for 20 years. And when, when that sunk in, it opened, it was the barrier of not believing that it could have happened of all the other memories. I didn't believe it. So once that barrier went down, I went and all the memories came back. I thought, Oh my God, that's what happened. Oh God. And then started writing it down. And started talking. Then I had, then I the memories, once they flooded back, I, I immediately went on Google Earth and, and I thought, and I've never been to Seattle at the point. I have been since, but I've still never been to Peru, to Bocas, Colorado, which, which is a whole nother story. Uh, I wow. covered it in my thing, but I'd never been there, but I looked at it on Google Earth. I know my way around it. Like I know it. I know it there. I lived there for two years during <clears throat> that 20 and back. I had a lot of, um, Sorry. I had a lot. Of the show, some people can't. Sorry, y'all. I know it's a different. It's a different subject. So good deal. <laughs> I put like um, the wrong comment up there. That was pretty funny. Sorry. No, it's okay. But um, when well, I started to find there. the places in the world, when I found the house in Seattle, when I found Inyo Kern, <laughs> California, and I found the town in Peru, I went, oh, oh, you know, I thought this is real. I've got to, um, I've got to tell somebody about this. I didn't know what to do with it, and I was just, I didn't want to take it all. There's just too much to take to the grave oh, um wow in the beginning it was fragments and it was more like chunks big chunks came all the emotional memories times that were emotional times that uh you know if i got beat up or fell in love or got hurt uh those memories were very clear and then the day-to-day -day memories were less clear more more fragmented to answer that question donna wow that is uh 
that's fascinating because it's like you went from being a kid and, and getting sent off and in, into outer space. You lived on the moon for a while, right? Very what was short that time. like? Okay. Very short time. It was what what was that like? What is the moon like? Uh it was industrial it was it was like office spaces. So it was like a narrow office building underground. It was like being in an office. You take an office building and you put it underground. That's basically was what it was like. And I was there for only a short time. Um, what what types of beings you see there, Tony? Um, grays, short ones, short robotic grays, taller, whiter looking grays, um, humans, blonde humans, Air Force personnel, um, taller humans, and then humans that were... Um, Work like seemed to be independent contractors that had they had more authority mm. than the military guys, and they seemed to be an independent. They were independent, working for a company for a corporation there, and really? they were they would tell the military guys to okay, you know shut up, go over there. Like they had authority um, in a few places. So um, for the most part, I was <laughs> moved around by Grace, and I had they were giving me surgeries. I went through a battery of surgeries for like a couple weeks. And um, retrained, put through another round of not 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 so much trauma based mind control, but like of another round of like electric shocking and trauma mind control, yeah. and uh, retrained. It was fight or flight response. They were they were retraining, and it was quick. It was, I wasn't there too long before I was shipped off. Did you okay, see any reptilians me. there? Any reptilians there? No, actually, I don't remember. Yeah, well, at the end, yes. So at the at the end on my return, when it was all over, at the end of the twenty years, they put me back. On, it was the moon base where I got reprocessed, and in that place where I was, and that was above ground. That was a building that was above ground. There were windows. They put me to an office, and I could see the surface of the moon. It was an above ground building, wow. and there were reptilians there. And actually, I had one that followed me around. Was the secure the security was a reptilian mm -hmm. from a heavy gravity planet. So he was security. So. Um, Yes. So to answer, so yes, they had, and he had clothes. A lot of people say they never wear clothes. He had, he was wearing, he wore clothes. He had clothes on. Oh my gosh, Tony, who who is in charge of all of these programs? Is this the Space Force, our U.S. military? Is it some kind of who's in charge? Everybody wants to know that. The truth <laughs> is, I, the truth is, I can't give you a great answer on that. Um, I think that the reality, and this is just from what what I remember, what I pieced together, is that. There are groups that are, you know, when you think about um, like Star Trek, how it's a, the Federation is a group of many different species that have a board, um, you know, that are, that are in control. Like, so a group like the Federation exists, and I'm talking about the Star Trek one, and then another one exists, and they work together, and they have personnel that mixes, they share the back of the moon, and that's what goes on. Federation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, what I'm saying is there you That's these groups though. you have to have a sponsor of these groups if you're gonna travel in space, if you're gonna explore deep space and you go somewhere, what's to stop anybody from just taking your ship? If you go some you are gonna go somewhere where there's people more highly advanced, why wouldn't they just take you and do whatever they want? But if you go there and you say, Look, I'm with this group of guys back here, and if you take us, more will come. They're gonna go, Okay, so what do you want? You're here to do business, and they take you seriously. So it's a it's that kind of mentality. You have to have a sponsorship, and I think a lot of what we're seeing in the world today, and over the last uh, six or seven years, are factions of the elites fighting over who's going to be the sponsor. Like some mm -hmm. want to sponsor with this group of aliens, so that we disclose and we join their community, and some want to sponsor with these group of aliens, and we want to join their community, and that's the fight that we're seeing. That's the that's what's going on politically and with all the shooting wars, that with all the crazy stuff that's going on. I think we're seeing the elites battling it out because some of them want to be sponsored with their group of ETs and others want to be sponsored with a separate group of ETs. And we'll see who wins. Either way, we're going to get a disclosure. Wow. You know, I was actually out in an investigation out in Tennessee. I have I have Drewski from Cryptid Warfare in the chat tonight. Uh, he was there with me during that investigation of a. Uh, bunch of cryptids on some property. And, uh, and as we were walking into the field one night, we we're going to go do some scouting. And I look, I happened to look up Tony and I saw Starlink 
Okay, Elon Musk, Starlink, and it looked like an Amtrak train in the sky. Okay, mm -hmm. and it, some of the guys had never even heard of it. They didn't know what it was. And, uh, and it was interesting seeing their reaction to it, not knowing anything about it. It was, uh, it was quite interesting. Well, I heard you, you talk about on an interview that you did, you had mentioned something about Elon Musk. Um, the first place that he actually put that was over in Antarctica. Yeah, that why, was in... Why was that? Well, so yeah, I'm, connecting, I'm connecting speculative dots, right? So that's all we got. We right like now. that. You got to pay attention. You got to pay yes. attention to what, ha what slips through the cracks and make okay. your own assumptions. So what I'm saying is there... What I remember that we called it the high command. So the Ceres Colony Corporation was under the direct umbrella of a Deutsch space program that had several colonies. So the, so the Ceres Colony Corporation had its own um, hierarchy, and that was an independent body, but they reported to the high command, which was in Antarctica. And then Elon Musk comes along, and he's got a Neuralink in him. He takes this long... You ask him a question, and he sits there, and he goes... Okay, so then, and then he comes out with the quite the answer. He's computing. So it's like he's <laughs> right. He's the using the neural link to look up the answer, waiting for the AI to answer it. Whoa! If you so watch his, robot, watch his Joe like... Rogan interviews, go watch him. He sits oh. there and he goes, and it's stupid, simple questions that you should, you know what I'm saying? Like when you ask people a question, they yeah. know the answer. They just come up with it. But he sits here and he's he's texting. He's going <laughs> like this in his mind. He's going, <laughs> oh, and then he starts talking. So that's what it seems like. Oh my gosh. Well, so what I'm just speculating, like I said, again, I'm just speculating here. Yeah. So we're it's talking, like he's not just human. He's we're just like hanging the robot. three of us. We're just hanging yeah. the three of us. That's all it is. Absolutely. We're just chilling. So talking. I think that he might have a neural. If you had a neural link and you were going to talk to him, <clears> that's the speed that you would answer questions. That's all I'm saying. <clears> for one. For two, so. Joe Rogan said, well, is, anywhere that, would neural, that, is there anywhere that Starlink's working right now? He said, yeah, over the poles, over Antarctica. And Joe Rogan literally said, why in the fuck? Is it who in the fuck would need it in Antarctica? And he stopped and he changed the question real quick. Like it made him uncomfortable. It made him uncomfortable. And um, so that's that points to kind of a, uh, you know, that would elude that that's yeah. behind him, that that's the, you yeah. know, that's that's the high command of the space program, of the secret space programs in Antarctica. Many oh. of them there. And I'm not the only one that's saying that. So that there are bases under, we all know the Germans were talking about it, New Shawland, you can't go there, you can't fly there. There's a lot about Antarctica. Antarctica. So for him to have Starlink there, when, well, why wouldn't you put it over the, over um, 19 and a half degrees where there's populace? Why wouldn't you put it over Europe? Why wouldn't you fly it right over Europe in the U.S., your very first Starlinks, you know, like, or up and down over South America and Europe where there's millions of people that can automatically subscribe. You wouldn't begin it where there's literally yeah. like, 80 people so in the whole continent so absolutely so that was odd and then there are other things you know like he's coming out with things that are that are way advanced you know just it's it if you or i invented something that was super advanced it would take us forever you know if you invented a new car an electric car you wouldn't it wouldn't make it it wouldn't make it the corporations would starve you to death you know they would get they would and they have and it's happened it's happened dozens of times in history where people invented great um, vehicles hydrogen um, bolt-ons for cars that was killed for all kinds of free energy stuff so he came out of nowhere and just immediately snatched up market share of from the world from the whole world it's just not the it's not the way that nature that it happens in nature you know his corporations they just don't exist the way that they should so I don't want to, um, whatever, dwell on this too long. You know, I think, <clears throat> Jessica, I think something really worth mentioning, <clears throat> and we've talked about this before at the conference too, but uh, I mentioned this before, that, that when I gave you the blind target of Trappist One yes. and what you saw and the slavery aspect of it, and, you know, taking that and even transferring that to what, uh, correlating that with what, Tompkins, Bill Tompkins said on Earth Files a few weeks ago about how much of our traffic coming through here is non-galactic, not Milky Way, and how much of this galaxy especially focuses on slavery. You've got tons of species doing that. And as a blind target, what you saw on Trappist One, and one of the first things you start telling me after you asking if it's future, Earth in the future is what's going on with all the slavery. 
So it's fr first person I thought about was Tony because yeah. privately, Tony, when we met at that first conference, we talked a lot, especially on the way back. And uh, you brought that to my, my, my attention, how much you've been involved with the slavery prospect aspect. And it was fascinating because for me, I don't, I didn't have the SSP type of uh, experiences. So I had not heard that part of your testimony or that part of it. But now the backup that's coming behind that is, it's, it's terrible. So Jessica, you can talk about that more than I, but. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I just, I didn't, I thought I was actually remote viewing earth, Tony. And uh, when I was, when I was in the target, I thought I was remote viewing earth in the future. Okay. And, uh, and, and, but there was a huge slavery aspect to it. And that was really pro uh, prominent in that target was slavery. And, uh, and so, yeah, but it turned out to be Trappist one. Okay. Uh, but it looked just like earth. They had high rises and mid rise apartments, shopping centers, vehicles. They had everything that we have here on earth, but it was not earth. Mm -hmm. There are several, I remember visiting several planets like that as far as how much of the populace was slaved. I, uh, don't, I don't have any idea of what the extent of it was, but yeah, it's, I mean, it's actually quite popular. If we, if we don't, if we're not sharp, we're, they're going to do it to us even worse than where we're at now. Believe me, there's plans in, in motion to do that, to, for that to be the reality on earth. Um, I want to say that I want to respond. Uh, the one he said that it didn't happen quickly. You put that up. What do you say about Musk? Uh, it wasn't oh, immediately as cra stock crashed I'm several times. It. Yeah. So yeah, that's great, but he still exists. So oh, yeah? there were many corporations that popped up that made a better car that don't exist. They had <laughs> their stock was driven into oblivion. So I mean, I, you know, I'm a I, I'm kind of a Musk fan. Like we people go, yeah. well, he's good or that. He dressed up like a demon for Halloween. With him. Whatever. He might be one of them. But nobody else is doing the space. Uh, SpaceX. Nobody else is getting us into space and doing advancing us the way that he is. So I'm a fan of his. Don't don't take don't take that wrong. And the the jury is still out whether he is you know good or bad. I'm kind of rooting for him over Zuckerberg. Um, <laughs> my money's oh, on yeah. Elon. My money's There's on Elon fight. Big E right. for the for the fight. Um, but slavery is um, it's a it's a minefield to speak about. Okay, let's talk. Oh, yeah. Let's just let me just throw this out there right now. There okay. are some people in the world today that understand the generational effects of slavery better than others. Oh. Okay, let's just put that on the table. So, as a result of that, it's an absolute minefield. I've had people really absolutely attack me because I've claimed to be a slave because I was in slave labor. And I said, Well, I was a slave, 20 years of slave in space. And I've had guys write me emails saying, Oh, you think you were a slave, huh? What do you this and that? And I've been greatly attacked over it. So it's a minefield, okay? So slavery is, we still feel the effects today. All of us feel the effects mm -hmm. of slavery in our world. The other thing is that currently there are more slaves in the world alive today living in slavery than have ever been. So we live in a more enslaved world now than ever in history, even when it was legal. There are more slaves. That, I don't know if you saw The Sound of Freedom the other day. So I went and saw it. Not yet. Yeah, go have a look at that movie. They tell us at the end. There is more there is more slavery now than there ever was in the world. Wow. So 50 million people are enslaved at the moment. And like a I lot said, of, a lot I of human trafficking. Math. It's like one it's like 6 out of 1000 people that are alive. There are 400,000 slaves in the United States right now. People that are living in slavery. So when we talk about it on some other planet, go, oh that's terrible. It's in our backyard, it's growing. Yes. It's growing. Slavery has gone away and we if we're not if we're not, it's a weed in the garden that we pulled out of the garden. A uh, hundred years ago, or whenever we did that, we got that weed out of the garden, but it's growing back, and it has to be tended. So that's just the way it is. And um, the other thing is, when you look at, you go, why? Why are these ETs? They have spaceships. Why do they? Why do they enslave? They got. They can make robots. We are the best robot. You're the best robot that there is. You, you're incredible. You're way more programmable than you think you are. A human being uses the amount of electricity and energy in one year the 250 watt light bulb uses in 24 hours. Wow. So that's how much it, we're, we're the most energy efficient machine. We're super talented. We can invent better ways to do things. We can dig a hole, then we can fill it with concrete. Then we can build a building on it. Then we can staff the building and get, so robots can't do that. You have to build a different robot for every time. So we are extremely the best robot that there is. And that's why ATs enslave us for one, for two. Uh, do you have a pet? Anybody here have a pet? Oh yeah, I do. A dog? <laughs> Yeah, so that's right your here. that's your security <laughs> system slave. 
it's living oh, that's in right. it's living in slavery too so the yeah. dog believe me wants to run free and a horse and anything all the pets especially if you have a bird god bless uh, birds want want to fly they don't want to be in a cave they're slaves yeah. all your pets are slaves so to, to say that slavery is something that's in the past and we're above it all it's like we're all living in a version of it right now your plants are slaves in a way like you, you know yeah. what what is the definition of it of what we're talking about oh here? my gosh and i don't want to I, I get yeah. confused can i get uh what do you call it accused of being stockholm syndrome like oh you stockholms you're making excuses for your slavers for the germans and i'm like i'm not but you need to we need to get away from the construct of good and evil that we're the good guys that are going to swashbuckle in and murder all the bad guys like america and so we need to get our we need to be it with logic we need to make it obsolete logically and so that's they're they're doing things in a logical manner yeah oh sorry. oh yeah Renee, Renee, i haven't been just, paying attention to these things i've been on my soapbox i don't man. Just, I just put them up there you, you're, you don't have to pay attention i'll read them to you uh renee actually wants me to bring both of you guys back on my thursday night show over on my channel and to talk for a few hours <laughs> that would be okay. fun Okay. It would be Tony. Before we go tonight, I mean, this hour went by really fast. It's already been an hour. It's already been yeah, almost an hour. It up. has. It's so fast. Even covered the new book. I know. That's what I was going to ask you. I okay, want to so talk you, about that too. you, at some point, you uh, started making stars. Okay, you are a a star constructionist. Okay, <laughs> so that's the word. Tell tell me about your new book and uh, and and tell everybody. Um, give us a little lowdown on it. Yes, What's funny what? is it's a it went to number one in reincarnation. What? Amazon, yeah, it's in reincarnation. <laughs> reincarnation. Yeah. Interesting. So the first book is much bigger and much thicker, and it's still not a very big book. Um, it's a yeah. fast read. This is a sequel. It's more of a companion, and it's a list of it's a it's one story surrounded by short stories every other chapter, and it's on purpose to be. Uh, confusing because to remember those things is also very confusing. So that's, and it's a bunch of stories that all tie together at the end to form one story when it's all done. But in the middle of the time, my consciousness, um, I'm sum this up and I'm going to be less um, thorough about examining how, telling you how it happened. Basically, the Series Colony Corporation made a deal with some ETs for an advanced technology and they sold uh, a few hundred of us off probably our consciousness for another 10 years of the same exact tech wow. and i lived as a non-human i lived in an et body that was an adolescent et body that was like a non um non-sexual existence it was a simpler body so it was a less consciousness to drive it it was like a clone but and uh it was very far away and we were building a star they had built they had built stars before. There was a bureau that spans, it's a corporation that spans galaxies and they build macro objects. They mostly build rings, planets, moons, and they were building stars and they put a ring yeah. around it. And they, the first stars that they built, it would take millions of years for the stars to stabilize to where they could put a ring around it and it wouldn't be destroyed. So this star that we were on, they were trying to build a dwarf star that would stabilize very quickly and they could immediately put a ring around it. So when um, we were there and that was the project, it was behind, it was running behind um, on ske the schedule it was. And so they had, they were desperate to expand the labor force to do it. And I had those memories and they were very deep, they're very distant, very fragmented memories. So I never really talked about them in interviews or on stage or anything. And series colony did so good. The first book did so good that everybody wanted another one. They're still wanting. They're like, please write another one. Like, a, oh, yeah. I get a lot of emails and people thanking me and everything, and it's, um, it goes right to my heart, and it's it's um, it's humbling for that to happen. And I will work on another book, but I mean, Series Colony Cavalier basically covered the experience, you know, the whole experience. So um, uh, this one was, and then Jackie Kenner, who's absolutely brilliant. Um, Jackie Kenner wrote, I think, five chapters in here of her own experiences. She's a psychic medium. And we would we were doing a show on Patreon. My Patreon show talks with Tony, and she mm -hmm. in between, you know how it is after you get done talking on camera, that um, you go, you you know that's when you get the real talk. And she said, Tony, this is the story that needs to come out. This is what you need to. And I said, Well, yeah, well, I gotta, you know, I gotta answer the questions I'm asked. So I don't know how I, I don't know how we're doing on time. Oh yeah, we have we have about a minute left, maybe a minute or two. Yeah. Okay, plenty so of time. Yeah, plenty of time. Two minutes. I, I just want everybody to know uh, to go 
join your Patreon, Talks with Tony. And, Talks with Tony, uh, and, yeah. And the and groups tell are everybody, there. Yeah, tell everybody where we can find. Uh, you said the books are there, too, because we have your website right here, too. The website will do it, TonyRodRiggs.com. Yeah. Links to all of the above, my memory course, consultations, both books, the Patreon, and plenty of free interviews, including my very first ones with Exopolitics that I ever did back in 2016. And uh, all that's there, and you can email me through it, too. But um, the Patreon show has different tiers of pay membership because the classes I do live and we do zoom calls and we do the tier three is like a um, remote influencing techniques okay. and the remote viewing class is remote viewing, studying different ways of those are on Sundays and Thursdays. And the tier three is on Tuesdays. And then I do a Q and a once a month where people can come and just ask me questions. Those are amazing and brutal and fun. Um, <laughs> and then I, I crank out episodes, two or three episodes a month, uh, of doing interviews with people too. So, yeah, man. Well, I, I thank you so much for coming on space out radio tonight and hanging out with Barry and I, Barry, thank you too, for being here. This oh, is my uh, pleasure. This is always a pleasure interacting with you both. I love yeah. you guys. And it's always like this time flies. It's where, you know what I'm saying? Like some friends time yeah. flies, and that's when, you know, it's a great time. So. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I think we just true. started talking five minutes ago. Is what it feels like. It does. It, does it feels feel like, like that. Hour, that's for sure. I mean, this is fascinating, Tony. Please come back and hang out with us, and uh, come sure. over to the Cryptid Huntress too over at that channel. And uh, we're gonna have some more talks. I want to do some remote viewing with you too. So, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, we'll 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 you know switch out some targets and do you some stuff. You both need to talk okay. about Mel's hole. You both re re reviewed it. We did a that's Mel's right. hole. And we had a pretty good review, and you know what they saw at the bottom was brickwork. Yeah, crazy so stuff. A lot of people, more, like two or three people, wow. got, got walls, brick walls in the bottom of it. Wow. I said, you go down the bottom, there's bricks. So wow. that's what we kept seeing. And then everybody described the hole, the big round. I don't know. It was a big black yeah. round thing. And they they were they did that. And then we reviewed it. And we, we were, because I even forget. I make up all the targets at once. And then I forget what it is. I yeah. make a target up. Me and then sure. I'm like, I don't even know what it is. You guys are describing it. So let me open it, and I, I'm just as shocked when when we open them. Yeah, I'm I'm always shocked when I'm on target, Tony. I really am, and uh, it's so much fun, and it's so much fun hanging out with you guys. I will see you guys uh, next time. I'm gonna um, say good night to both of y'all, and please come back and see me, okay? And Absolutely. you guys can wait around. Y'all two can wait around and talk after I close out the show if y'all want. So I'm just saying. Yeah, that's cool. All right, bye, y'all. Okay, I'm gonna take y'all down. I gotta close the show out. Let's see if I can get this to go off. Oh, yeah. Okay, everybody. That was amazing. Thank you all so much for sticking around. Um, please go see Marquis on After Hours right after this, uh, right here on Space Out Radio. Uh, next time on Off the Trails, my guest is Ron. Who do I have? Oh, Ron Murphy is coming on. The Crypto Guru will be here. We're going to be talking about vampires tomorrow night, you guys. Vampires and all the creatures of the night. Um, I will see you guys tomorrow. You guys go lock your doors and... Uh, have a great night. Okay. We'll see y'all next time. If I can close it out. Bye y'all. <laughs>